Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today, inshallah, we'll talk about um, uh, chapter 17, so our second part uh, in our biology course. And starting here, uh, it's a very different subjects from what we've been talking about before. We talk, now we're going to talk about classifications of living things um, and how living things are classified. The world is a very big place, so how do we begin to classify things so we can try to uh, make better sense, better sense of it. Uh, this chapter is divided basically into three parts, and this slide gives you an overview of those three part, parts. First, we're going to talk about how living things are classified and how this evolved, and the binomial uh, classification system, which is uh, currently in use. Uh, as um, uh, we'll talk about that briefly. And then we will have a brief introduction to the six kingdoms uh, of living things, which we're going to talk about in detail in subsequent chapters. And finally, how are evolutionary relationships determined between living things? How are evolutionary relationships determined between living things? Which is uh, a very important aspect of classifying uh, living things. So. Taxonomy is the official term for the science of classification of organisms based on their characteristics. Of course, things are classified according to, uh, to their similar characteristics. It's like if you separate the laundry, you separate it according to certain characteristics, right? Same way, the living things are classified according to similar characteristics. And the science of this classification is called taxonomy. It's a very old science. Aristotle proposed his own classification system. And his was reasonably simple, and he classified living things broadly into plants and animals. And he classified uh, plants then again into small, medium, and large-sized plants, and then he subsequently also classified animals into, uh, into land animals, water animals, and air animals. So this was an early attempt at classification of living things. Now, the credit goes over uh, to uh, uh, Carolus Linnaeus, a very famous uh, Swedish scientist who came up with this uh, 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 classification system, which is still uh, currently used. And this is called a binomial classification system, bi meaning two, nomial meaning names. So in this classification system, every living creature is given two names, like a first name and a last name, so to speak. And this classification is still uh, in use. It was from Sweden. So the binomial classification system of Carlos Linnaeus um, uh, is based on structural similarities, uh, which uh, he presumed uh, suggested relationship between uh, living things. So living things that have similar structures um, then would be classified in the same uh, uh, in the same uh, category, but back then, of course, he, they they did not know about DNA, proteins, and etc. So it was a primary classification was limited to uh, structural similarity between living things. Okay, now we add to that and DNA similarities, uh, etc. For example, in this way, bats uh, f they fly, so one might think that they are uh, birds, but they're but they're not birds, but because they have hair and they produce milk like mammals. So bats, bats are classified as mammals and uh, not as birds. So you look at structural similarities, not in a superficial sense, but in a more detailed sense. And because they fly there for their birds, that, that's not going to fly, so to speak. I have to go a little bit more detail than that. So then, according to Carlos Linnaeus, then uh, the binomial nomenclature naming system Homo sapiens is the name that's given to human beings. So human beings have a name. As I said, this is a binomial nomenclature, which means it has two names, first name and then last name, so to speak. So human beings are classified as Homo sapiens. The word Homo means, uh, uh, is, is the first name, and this is the name of the genus uh, or group of similar species. So uh, the first name here, Okay, first part of the name is the genus of those particular species, and the second part of the name is the species itself. Okay, so in case of Homo sapiens, this implies sentient beings. Okay, uh, thinking beings—that's what the word literally means, thinking beings. 
So the first name is, uh, is for genus of a species, and the second name is a proper species, specific species name, so Homo sapiens. Now, when you write this binomial nomenclature, they, they are italicized in print. So if it's printed like it's over here, it is uh, italicized. But if you're writing this in, in a paper uh, handwriting, you would underline it when you write these names uh, to suggest that these are scientific names. Okay, And then also notice that only the genus is capitalized. The species name uh, is not capitalized. Only the first name is capitalized here. So the first name is the genus of the species, and the second name is the species species name, so to speak. Okay. And then you would underline this in handwriting, and you would italicize that in print. Now, why do we even have these complicated names, right? Well, because common names can be very t tricky and just as difficult sometimes to work with. For example, so what is the difference then between scientific versus common names? So common names can be confusing, equally confusing. For example, if you have a seahorse, which is not a horse, and it's not a horse that lives in the sea, but it's like a, a, a sea creature, a little tiny thing that looks like a horse, and so somebody in, in their imagination, they named it a seahorse. But if somebody didn't know that, if they come from a different country, they would think seahorse would be you know, uh, uh, trotting upon in the street any time now, right? So common names have their own challenges and difficulties like that and a species may have more than one common name in the same area somebody might call the same species with different names okay and if you go to a different country the same species might have different names in different languages right so as many languages there are there would be that many different types of you know names for that particular species so these are the drawbacks that the scientific name uh, attempts to uh, eliminate so look at this one, for example. This is a common house sparrow. That's how we know it. But if you go to Canada or Britain or somewhere in Europe or China, this sparrow would be known by some other name. But in the scientific community, regardless of where you are in the world, this house sparrow has the same name, Passer domesticus. And everybody agrees that in scientific paper and literature, if you want to refer to this sparrow, then you would have to refer to a scientific name to avoid confusion. And that's one of the beautiful aspects of this nomenclature is that it is generally agreed upon to avoid a confusion. So uh, this sparrow, regardless of its name in, in different parts of the world, a common name, will have the same scientific name in scientific literature. In this way, then, the taxonomists can agree uh, universally uh, on, on the names, and the the classification system is very vigorous. In other words, taxonomists can easily distinguish between similar appearing plants. I mean, to you and I, these two, poison ivy and Virginia creeper, they might look very similar, but they are such, their uh, 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 exquisite observations that scientists make to distinguish between different types of leaves and uh, uh, plant structures. So it's very easy to distinguish between different types of species. So, further, the uh, uh, classification system tried to elucidate or highlight evolutionary relationships between living things. They try to highlight evolutionary relationship between living things, okay, by looking at external features or even internal features for comparisons. You can look at the, uh, an organism the way it appears outwardly, but you can also look at how it looks inwardly in terms of its organelles and even an embryological development at, at its different stages in life and compared to different living things to see if they are related. And uh, and also it tries to use a geo geographic distribution uh, of living things and if, if, uh, if two living things are related but in different geographic uh, uh, areas then it might suggest that one of them migrated or something happened that brought one uh, to the other location. So these classification systems have are uh, 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 try to highlight some of the things that might be of importance to us. So in this way, dinosaurs are more closely related to birds than lizards, which are reptiles. 
Now, how in in if how, how you are really think how can that be? How can birds be similar to dinosaurs? If anything, the lizards are, look more like dinosaurs. But no, that's because outwardly a lizard might look like a dinosaur, but inside of it, it's nothing like a dinosaur, right? Whereas a bird uh, outwardly looks nothing like a dinosaur, but its internal structure is more like a dinosaur. So in, when you classify living things, you just don't look at outward appearances of the thing. You also look at internal appearance. You look at the living thing in its different developmental stages. Uh, so it's a pretty extensive, elaborate science is what is trying to be suggested here. So how are living things then classified? So in this binomial classification system of uh, Linnaeus, uh, uh, living things are classified into different categories, uh, starting from the very broadest category to the very uh, smallest category. And these categories are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are seven different categories, okay, starting from the most broadest category to the uh, most specific category. And again, there are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, I remember this from, from my high school class, actually, that uh, a, a mnemonic, ha, ha, to, to remember this, king plays chess on Fridays, generally speaking. King plays chess on Fridays, generally speaking. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, this is uh, 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 this is very important. This is that you have to know this really, really well. Um, some taxonomists uh, also use a, a division uh, as a category instead of phylum. Um, some minor variation, but we, we should go along with this. So, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species is a classification system. Okay, it's like saying, uh, where do you live? I live on planet Earth. Look, we're on planet Earth, we live in the United States, and we're in the United States, we live in Illinois, etc. Like that, so they get more and more and more and more and more specific. So, for example, if you look at the kingdom, animal kingdom, okay, you have all the animals that are on the planet here that we know. And then, and then, and then the subcategory of phylum, you, you, you take only a, some of the animals uh, which, ha, uh, which, have, which are chordates. They are particular animals that have chordates, like a backbone type of thing. And then among them, you take, and then if you subclassify, okay, which one of these have, are, are mammals? And then that will exclude a whole bunch of other animals that are not mammals. And among the mammals, which one are carnivores? Well, here's the, all the carnivores, and you exclude the ones that are not carnivores. And then among them, which one are, uh, are, are have a particular characteristic? And then among them, which one are these? And, and then like this. So the categories go from the, the most broadest category, which is the animal kingdom. Notice this is animal kingdom, so all the plants are already excluded. And then and this category subsequently get more and more and more and more narrowed down into the specific. So from here to here, what uh, things are being excluded based on particular characteristics, okay? For example, from, from going from the chordate phylum to the class mammalia, so you're only taking those chordates which are mammals and exclude everything else which are not mammals. And then you subsequently narrow it down into one specific species, Canis lupus, which looks like a wolf or something like that. So, so species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. This is a broad classification. Now, if you if you take this as for Homo sapiens and human beings, they, the species name is Homo sapiens, member of a group of, of genus Homo, with high forehead and 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 thin skull bones, and we are the only single species of this genus. In fact. The genus that we belong to is, is Homo, that's therefore it's Homo sapiens. And the family that we belong to are hominids, and the order that we belong to are primates, and the class that we belong to are mammals, and the phylum that we belong to are chordates, and kingdom that we belong to are animals. In other words, we are animals that are chordates, 
And among the chordates, we are the ones that are, are mammals. And among the mammals, we are primates. Among the primates, we are hominids. And among the hominids, we are homos. Uh, and among the homos uh, the, uh, genus, we are the homo sapiens. Okay, that's the specific uh, species name for human beings, according to this particular classification. So, for example, now if, it, if you go back over here, let's look at this family, how, now how, how these divisions are made. Now, consider a different family. Here's a family called Philidae, family Philidae. In this family, there are two genuses, okay, uh, and genus Philus and genus Lynx. And they're different, okay. Here's, here's Philus consular, apparently, and these are, uh, this is a Lynx, and this is the two types of Lynxes. So, this family is divided into two genuses, and each genus is divided into species. There's one species here, and in this genus, there are two species here. Okay, so family, genus, and particular species. Now, these look very similar, but the observations sci scientists make are related to very, very, very specific things. For example, the, uh, uh, this particular family, family fluid, they are short faces, small ears, four limbs have five toes, hind uh, limbs have four toes, that includes cats and lions. And the lynx uh, has a jaw with 28 teeth, and the felis has a jaw with 30 teeth, okay? So, uh, and, and, and uh, these two are different based on the number of teeth they have. It's really amazing. So they go and count these, and you know, obviously, that they're sleeping or they're dead or something. Like they don't want to go and go in there and ask them to, if they could count their teeth. But, uh, so, it, this is how detailed these uh, uh, observations are. So they they look at the ears, the teeth size, and how their paws, and etc. So that's how the classifications are done. So here's a brief uh, introduction to the kingdom. So we talked about how living things are classified in initial attempts of Aristotle, etc., and then we settled on Linnaeus's binomial classification or the scientific classification method that is still in use. And then now we're going to talk about a brief introduction to the six kingdoms. And then we're going to talk further a little bit about evolutionary relations to things. So broadly speaking, all living things are classified into six big categories. These are known as kingdoms. Okay, broadly speaking, all living things on the planet are categorized into six different kingdoms or six different categories. So these categories are called kingdoms, okay? And Two of these are bacteria. So two of the six kingdoms belong to bacteria. That kind of gives you a sense of awe and respect for these creatures. So of the six kingdoms, two of them belong to bacteria. And their kingdom, Archibacteria, old ancient bacteria, Arche means old ancient bacteria, and kingdom, Eubacteria, or true bacteria. So of the six kingdoms, two of them belong to bacteria. These are thought to be evolutionary, the oldest creatures that have lived on this planet, as we talked about before. And then from these, the most slightly more advanced is the kingdom protista. These are protists. These are like, you know, interesting little creatures, okay? And, f and then from these, a little bit more complicated, the more familiar kingdoms of fungi. You know the fungi? They have their kingdom of their own. You wonder it's so special, right? The fungi. You wouldn't think that, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't think that. What is the fungus that have to have their own kingdom? But they do because they're so so unique. Fungi look like plants, but they're nothing like plants, right? And then there's animal kingdoms. So these are the six kingdoms. So all living things on the planet are are are, are either going to be archibacteria, eubacteria, protist, fungi, plants, or animals, kingdom plantae, or kingdom animalia. So everything on this planet that we appreciate can be classified into one of these categories, right? Now, finally, how do we determine evolutionary relationships between living things, okay? So we talked about classification system. I introduced you to six kingdoms. And then I said one of the major goals of, of classification system is to try to elucidate the evolutionary relationship between living things. So how do we do that? Now. There are many ways how uh, we determine evolutionary relationships between uh, organisms. One way is to look at structural similarities, as we talked about before. Look at the structure of the living things. For example, dandelions and sunflowers. 
dandelions and sunflowers. They are related, believe it or not. So dandelions and sunflowers are related. They're in the same family. The reason they're in the same family because they have similar flower structure. Okay, they're all disc flowers. I mean, they have flowers that look like discs. Okay, and this one has bushy uh, uh, petals. That's why the disc is hidden. But they all have disc flowers. Okay, and they all have similar fruit structure. Their fruit structure they look they're, they look very similar. Okay, so one way of determining uh, evolutionary relationship is by looking at structures. And for example, we can look at claws. Cert there are certain uh, uh, animals that have retractable claws, like your kitten has retractable claws. So, you can, so they're in the cat family. So, uh, so looking at structures can help us determine evolutionary relationships between living things. Another way is looking at observing the breeding behavior of living things. Breeding behavior of living things. Obviously, species that are more closely related will have uh, uh, similar breeding behavior. Now look at these two frogs. They, to you and I, or at least to me, they could be cousins for what I know because they look so similar. Even though they look similar, they're actually different species. Okay, They look similar and they even live in the same area, but the males uh, of, uh, of different, uh, have different mating calls. You know, they attract only uh, uh, females of their own species. So they, 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 their breeding behavior is so distinct that they don't interbreed, so they are different uh, species because um, ability to breed is a cardinal feature of how we define species. If you recall, species are those living things that are able to interbreed that in, and produce a viable offspring. Another way of, of, uh, of determining uh, evolutionary relationship is by geographical distribution. If things are in a similar geographical distribution, they're more likely to be related, correct? That's fair enough. On the other hand, if you consider that the Earth was like a Pangaea one time, and you, you notice that uh, certain uh, uh, fossils of certain very similar things occur in similar areas of what is now very different geographic locations, but at one time they were in the same uh, uh, area. For example, the fossil of this particular organism will be found in this area. You'll never find them over here because it makes sense because they started out in that area. So when we talk about geographical distribution as to whether or not species are related, how can a species that lives in Australia be related to a species that lives in over here, for example? Because at one time the Earth was not the way it is right now. The, the continents were not separated as they are right now. They were together. So a living thing that's in the tip of Africa over here might be related to a living thing that's in South America. Okay. So when we say geographic proximity, you have to take look at the big picture. That at Earth, what at one time was not like how we imagine uh, how, how it is presently. Now we add to this chromosomal similarities. Now, if you look at chromosomes, the more similar chromosomes of DNA are, you understand, the more closely related the species is. A species that has uh, uh, 10 chromosomes is going to be similar to a species that has another 10 chromosomes, and it's not going to be related to a species that's going to have, like, you know, 18 chromosomes or something like that. Right? So just the number of chromosomes would help uh, uh, determine uh, similarities or closeness of relationship between different species. Because of this, you, uh, all, all of these things that you love to eat are, believe it or not, are, uh, are very similar um, uh, species because they have very same chromosome uh, structures. Add to that another uh, uh, dimension is uh, species can be classified uh, as similar based on their biochemical similarity. Forget the number of chromosomes. If they have the same number of chromosomes, the exact genetic sequences, the more similar genetic sequences are, you would appreciate that those species would be more closely related, and more dissimilar genetic sequences are, the more, uh, uh, the more unrelated the species would be. And then you can compare either genetic sequences at gene level or amino acid level in proteins because protein structure, if you recall, is ultimately derived from the genetic sequence of that organism. So by studying the DNA and by studying the protein, um, you can determine similarities and closeness in evolutionary history of species. Pay attention? Okay. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about before we pause today. 
And that is, by doing all of this, we can kind of make a family tree of all living things, okay? And the family trees of living things, this is called the phylogenetic models, that is speci species classification according to presumed evolutionary lineage. Now, what you have to do is you have to stand and you have to repeat to yourself phylogenetic model. And you have to say it enough times so when you say it out, it looks cool and natural. Because if it didn't even say it out and it looks funny, then you know, it kind of says you don't get it type of thing. So, repeat it and understand it until you're comfortable with these terms. Phylogenetic models, species classification according to a presumed evolutionary lineage. Now, I say presume because how do we know that different species didn't evolve in different petri dishes in, on the earth, so to speak, from millions and billions of years ago? And uh, how, how come they, they could have evolved from different parts of the earth into different species? It's possible. But then you have to explain also the genetic uh, similarities between species and how they all use DNA as a genetic material, etc. So this is still presumed. These are all still theories. Nobody was there but uh, 2.5 billion years ago to make accurate observations, right? But nevertheless, phylogenetic models are classification systems that are, uh, try to delineate the uh, family tree of species um, as, like, like you see over here. So phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species. Phylogeny is evolutionary history of species. One specific example of this is this called uh, a science called clandistics. This particular science assumes that there's a common ancestor of, or, or, uh, of an organism whose unique characteristics are retained. If you don't assume that, then you know the uh, living things could have evolved in, in a parallel fashion. But this science, cladistics, sorry, uh, this science, the cladistics, assumes that there's a common ancestor. And if you assume that you could a common ancestor, then you can make a picture like this based on the observations uh, of, of, of uh, by various different things that we talked about. And you make it a cladogram. This is a pedigree of similar species. Hence, we can say that the modern robin that we see in American robin, for example, here, had evolved from ancient type of dinosaurs like this. Okay? And uh, uh, these type of, of, of diagrams are called cladograms or uh, uh, pedigrees of, of different living things. So as an introduction to the next several chapters, we are going to study these six kingdoms in detail. And if you recall, the six kingdoms start out with the two of these kingdoms are dedicated entirely to bacteria, archaebacteria and eubacteria. And the third kingdom are the protists, and uh, the fourth kingdom are the fungi, and the fifth kingdom are the plant kingdom, and then there's the animal kingdom. And our next several weeks are going to be dedicated to studying each of these different kingdoms individually, and we're going to elaborate them. And then by the time we're done with these, inshallah, we'll have a much better appreciation of, uh, uh, of, of the world around us. Until next time, as-salatu wa-salamu 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 wa